Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laurie Smith on Blog Talk Radio, and it is 6 o'clock in the morning here, Calgary, Alberta, April 29th. And um, I'm so happy to be here. This is one child abuse survivor to another. We're on for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. The chat room is open if you want to go and sit in there and uh, anyone's up at this time and wants to hang out in the chat room, that's great. Uh, we're going to continue on talking about, uh, well, we were looking at uh, child sexual abuse, preventing child sexual abuse last week and the week before. And uh, from an article I found from Stop It Now at www.stopitnow.org. And we finished up with that and then I wanted to, but it's a great website so if you want to go back and look at that the article is really it's quite good I really liked it um, it had some different types of material on there that I had seen from other websites so that's why I really liked it there was some different information on there regarding how to how to keep yourself safe and how to prevent child sexual abuse and so um, I wanted to look at uh, sort of issues surrounding you know adult survivors of child abuse uh, child sexual abuse especially uh, and common coping mechanisms this is from the awareness center that um, we started looking at yesterday morning. And so I wanted to finish that up. It's a very short article, and uh, we're going to finish that up and then maybe look at some other information that I found regarding uh, common symptoms in adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. So we'll just look at that this morning, and um, you know, I'm glad you could be here. Thank you so much for tuning in and for your support. And uh, you know, it's not a professional show. I don't hold any professional counseling certificates or therapist certificates. Um, you know, I'm just a person who does you know pays to do my own show and um just because mainly i think that child abuse isn't going to go away unless we start talking about it and unless we start standing up and making some noise uh, regarding uh you know what we want our lawmakers to do and what we want uh you know the 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 government to do as far as funding goes to really stop child abuse and make a huge difference for these children today so this is the whole issue. I, I'm just a, I'm a student, part-time student at MRU here in Calgary, in between courses, just because I couldn't afford to go uh, last winter, so I had to take a break. But I want to continue on in that and uh, and continue on with child rights, human rights, and um, you know, continue just getting the word out there that we have to start talking about these things, or they are not going to go away. If we keep it silent and keep uh, abuse uh, silenced, then it's allowed to continue on. What people don't know about, they don't have to worry about. And, you know, what people don't know about, they can't prevent. And what people don't know about, they're not concerned about. And so I think that, you know, the more we, we start talking about this, and the more, cause there are some awesome people out there doing some amazing work, and I just wanted to come behind them and sort of just add my voice, because I know that people have been doing this for years and years and years and years. And I tell you, I've been listening, because I'm a survivor of child abuse, and I know what 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 happens to children when they're abused and I know what happens to families when they don't get any help so I just think that uh, you know I'm just happy to be you know one more voice just to add my voice so listen at your own discretion please because I cover everything uh, regarding abuse child abuse uh, domestic violence uh, sexual abuse you name it um, so you have to listen at your own discretion please if the to- if the topic bothers you or you think it might bother you please turn the show off because your safety is number one, and you have to listen at your own discretion and know what's good for you to listen to. And then if you're a young person under the age of 18, I'm fighting for you for to keep you alive. I know there's so many people out there that are doing the same thing. It's not a joke. Uh, there's about 750 million child sexual predators trying to get a hold of you, so you want to keep yourself safe, and you want to keep yourself uh, you know, and your friends protected. So get some online safety information and start following what it says. It's so important. You don't want to just pretend that, oh, well, it's no big deal, you know, um, you know, it won't happen to me. Well, one in three girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused in some way before under the age of 18. So online safety is huge, and I think that a lot of adult content I do, I cover, this, this show is ultimately about child abuse and stopping child abuse and for children. But the fact is, is that this material is quite adult-oriented, and I don't know where the players are nowadays. You know, and so I think it's just important you have permission to listen to this show. And also, just because if you have questions or you can't quite understand what the material is all about, because you maybe have not heard of it before, then you can ask someone to help you to find the, to find the resources that and the references that you need, maybe at a library or, or online, to actually find out more information about what I'm talking about. And also... You know, if it's something that you don't understand, if you have an adult, adult listen with you and, uh, you know, someone who you'd really trust, you know, a parent who really cares about you and wants the best for you and wants to spend time, 
to help you to learn and, and to understand and to protect yourself and um, and to protect your you know your family. Um, they can help you with it, to find information regarding what what we're discussing on here. So you know, just listen to your, be very careful what you're doing online if you're a young person because there are some really crazy psychotic people out there who would love to get a hold of you. And it's a fact; it's happening. Just start looking around in the paper, and uh, don't ever meet anyone that you meet in a chat room who says, "Oh, I'm I'm 12 years old and I love to skateboard and I, I want to meet after school," because this could be an adult child sexual predator just seeing if you'll meet them there and then if you are there they will they will grab you and snag you and if they don't kill you uh then your life will be ruined because of the abuse so do not ever meet anyone that you meet uh in a chat room like that and be very very careful what you have information that you give out don't give out your real name don't use your real name uh don't use uh, don't don't give out your address never give out your phone number don't phone these people back they have call caller id on the other end and they can see who you are they will get your information, and uh, they, they basically do anything they can to get a hold of you. So make sure and you don't want to live in fear because fear is a real problem. Uh, what you want to do is become educated, and then learn how to keep yourself safe. Right? So important. So we'll get right onto this uh, article here. It's the it's called Common Coping Mechanisms Used by Adult Survivors of Childhood Sexual Abuse. We started talking about it yesterday. It's a very short article. Uh, it's from the Awareness Center Incorporated, which is www dot the awareness center dot org and uh I just thought it was interesting because they gave they, they list here uh let's see how many twenty one different um ways that you know uh, sort of survivors adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse actually cope some of them are quite harmful uh and the whole issue is 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 due to the abuse due to the the childhood sexual abuse this is what happens to a lot of people and then be, they become adults they they survive the abuse and then they have all these issues that they have to work through so the important reminder they actually wrote this here I'm just reading right from this page this article is quite old but it doesn't matter because the information is still the same uh, important reminder says when reviewing this list it is important to remember that the information provided should not be used as the sole determiner of childhood sexual abuse this list only provides the reader with a list of some common coping mechanisms that are used by many adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. It is also important to remember that coping mechanisms are learned behavioral patterns used to cope. They are not necessarily all good or bad, and many individuals have used their abuse learned, learned coping mechanisms to benefit from professionally and in other personal situations. So um, I was reading those out yesterday, just starting to read them out. Uh, the minimizing abuse, uh, he, he, you know, this person's story, you know, they minimize the abuse saying, uh, you know, oh, well, it wasn't that big of a deal or, you know, they didn't really abuse me that much, right? That's minimizing the abuse, right? It says minimizing the abuse uh, and actions of offenders. That's something that, that survivors of childhood sexual abuse and really child abuse of any kind will do. Uh, they will rationalize one's victimization saying, oh, uh, he or she just didn't know any better, or he or she was also abused as a child by rationalizing, you know, the actual abuser's um, behavior, right? And that's a real issue. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's like myself, you know, when I went public with my story, you know, I, I, I had a lot of time to think about it, you know, over, four, over well, at least, you know, 35 to 40 cognitive years to think about what happened to our family and um, you know I could kind of see well you know my mom was abused as a child and and my dad had mental issues and was struggling with schizophrenia borderline schizophrenia and, and they were both depressed and they had a lot of problems and uh, so you know I could say well you know my mother was abused and that's why she did what she did but you know uh, I never condone the abuse and I don't condone abuse of any kind and I can understand what happened and take a bigger look at the whole picture, which has helped me to heal, because I'm looking at it from a different perspective instead of an angry perspective. Of view, I'm looking at it as as someone, an outside third third party, might look at it, and which has allowed me to see the big picture, and 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 it's really helped me out in my healing process. But I still don't condone it, and I just can't really, uh, you know, say that it was right or it was okay or you know minimize the abuse. It's very important, right? Um, Denial. This is another one. It's more comfortable for both a child and adult survivor to pretend the abuse never occurred and then face the emotional, psychological pain of the violence. 
or the violation, right? Uh, denial, that's a real problem for people. And I know my family lives in denial. Uh, my uh, siblings that are here, that are left, which aren't very many of us, uh, basically just want to go on with their lives. They'd rather not face this thing. They don't want to have anything to do uh, with what I'm doing. And they don't acknowledge the abuse, and they don't acknowledge uh, any of it because they are so... I believe that what happened in our family was so devastating, that, and it happened over a period of so many years, that uh, they just want to go on with their lives. They don't want to address it. Whereas me, I want to stop child abuse. So I figured if I'm going to be a public speaker and go out there and start talking about human rights and child rights and uh, raise my voice as a public figure you know, to get the word out, then I'm going to have to come to, you know, to terms and to grip with what happened to our family. It was complete, complete devastation. It's really unfortunate. A lot of people didn't see it that way. They thought, uh, you know, that just because uh, there was a couple of us living that, you know, things were okay. You know what I mean? Oh, well, you know, the parents are still alive and there's a few siblings left. Isn't that great? Uh, no one cared to take a look at what happened to our family. And even though they knew there was some serious problems there, uh, there was so many people that turned a blind eye to it because they loved my parents, because my parents could really manipulate people and they were very good at getting people to feel sorry for them. They were actually really uh, nice people to other people. And they were uh, they had lots of friends and their friends loved them very much. But the issue is, is they were hateful people who destroyed their children's lives and then uh, you know, solicited uh, support and concern for themselves instead of their children. And so they had a lot of friends and they had a lot of support. Where And then the kids just kind of, we just kind of floundered along. And then, uh, you know, some of the siblings, uh, you know, went the wrong way. One killed himself and the other one died of a drug overdose. And people just thought they were just drug users and just losers, right? And they didn't really look to see the situation. There was no proper parenting. Uh, there was no coping skills in our home. There was violence, abuse. Uh, it was horrible. It was absolutely a nightmare and even these people today, there's a few of them that will acknowledge that, you know, okay, they didn't really realize that this was happening. And, you know, I can see that. But then, you know, I know when people's, people are having problems. And I can tell when there's issues going on. And if all of a sudden, if you see a whole family just spinning off into a serious, you know, problem, you know there's been something going on there and it's been something wrong. So, you know, denial, I mean, I just can't live in denial. And my family, if they want to continue, you know, the rest of them want to live in denial, that's their own business. I'm not going to push it, you know. I'm not going to push the issue. I can't force them to uh, to not be in denial. That's the way they're coping. But the thing is, is I didn't want to be in denial because I wanted to go, I wanted to, to make a difference in this world and not deny abuse because that's why abuse is allowed to continue. Because, oh, you know, it never happened, right? As long as survivors will just keep it pushed under the rug along with society and the public and everybody else, um, you know, just keep it pushed, tucked away nicely so that nobody has to deal with it, it's going to be allowed to continue to happen. And so that's the whole issue. Every single person out there needs to stand up and say something about this. Because babies are dying and children are dying. Horrific deaths. We're not talking quick and easy and painless. We're talking abuse that is so damaging and so, it's like torture. You know what I mean? Um, it's the worst thing you can possibly think of. These kids are dying at the hands of their caregivers and parents every day. If they're not dying, they're in the hospital from abuse-related injuries. That's if the abuse is reported. Otherwise, you're sitting at home, you know, trying to, to stay alive. And so that's why, I, you know, I, can, I can't sit back and just not be silent anymore. I did for quite a few years. And when I finally decided to get off the couch is when my real healing started to happen. Because I thought, you know, I, I can't sit and suffer in silence anymore. Because I don't want to go to my grave with this. And I don't want to go to my grave not doing anything at all to stop child abuse. You know, after coming from the family that I came from, which was just a, a sad, sorry excuse for, for, for a family, um, you know, the, the, and I'm going to sit back and just not say anything? That's the whole issue, right? That's what denial is, is not necessarily a good thing. But everybody's in a different place as far as their healing situation goes, their, their healing journey. So I would say that eventually people, you know, you know, eventually some, a lot of us do come to terms like myself and decide to no more denial and, you know, know where to put the blame. 
and uh, and then do something about it. And if you know if a person doesn't want to go on to help stop child abuse, that's their business. But the whole issue is, is that I'm glad to be doing this, and I'm glad to be able to be a voice because I want to see some change made. I thought, okay, how many years left do I have on this planet? Uh, okay, I'll spend the rest of them doing this. I have nothing better to do with my time than to try to help people and to try to get the word out. You know, and to try to promote education and awareness and prevention of of this kind of stuff, right? And for for human rights as well, not just child abuse. But I'm so this is where my heart is because I think children, can, you know, children can't stand up for themselves, and they need help and protection. And so, you know, I thought, what am I doing with the rest of my life? I may as well do something pro- proactive, you know, and get some get just be one more voice. So that's the whole thing. I can't live in denial, but a lot of people do. And it's unfortunate because that's what allows abuse to continue. Because what people don't know about, as long as as uh, families can keep abuse hidden, then no, there will be no help for that child. That's the whole issue. As long as abuse is hidden away and denied, then these children will continue to suffer in these homes. If they're not killed, they'll just suffer along for years and years. That's the whole issue with denial, and I don't like it. I, I, I don't appreciate it. But uh, I guess it's just something people do to cope. And they can't help themselves, right? Uh, repression and forgetting is another one. One's body's way of denying victimization. And I guess, you know, I've had some uh, some memories that are sort of foggy. I have repressed a few memories, and uh, especially of the of the sexual the child sexual molestation that I experienced. I do know it happened. I do remember um, being very upset about it, but I don't remember the face. So I can't put a face with it, and I think it's because I blocked it out, uh, because I just was—it was so upsetting, and so that can happen. I'm, I'm trying to work through uh, on my own without a therapist or anything, because I can't really afford therapy right now. Uh, but eventually, I'd like to have uh, a counselor or a therapist, you know, kind of help walk me through it. But the thing is, is I, you know, I try to to, to uh, sort of allow myself to experience that 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 victimization, that 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 you know horrible situation that I went through as an eight-year-old and um, um, slowly you know over time and more and more comes to mind what happened you know what I mean and, and who, who it was but I still can't see the face and so I'd really like to be able to to you know see the face so that I can make peace with it and move on you know what I mean uh, splitting it says seeing the world in terms of black and white no shades of gray common in survivors when the behavior of the offender was either abusive or loving but no middle so I guess that's if, an, if a survivor uh, uh, was in a, an abusive home and there was no middle, sort of no in-between. It was all either abuse or it was all loving. So that's kind of interesting. I don't have those issues, I don't think, because um, I'm very sort of just straightforward. I've always been this way. Um, you know, I don't sort of uh, see the world in terms of black and white, I don't think. Um you know, I can kind of look at the bigger picture, and I'm very much a, an easygoing person. But I think that that can happen when it's extremes. Like in our home, there was just a it was a drag all the time. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. We had a few fun moments. I mean, Christmas and you know, every once in a while, nobody bothered to really celebrate anybody's. We celebrated birthdays usually just like once a year, uh, one birthday, because there was so many of us. And so usually like in June, we'd have one cake for everybody, and that'd be it. And then, um, so it wasn't a big deal. Nobody really cared. And uh, and for my birthday, it was just too close to Christmas, and nobody really cared that I was around anyway. So, I mean, it was very rarely a birthday party for me until I got way older, like in my 20s. So, um, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of fun. And so it was just a bad situation from day one when I was born. I was born into this uh, abusive home. So that's why maybe I didn't split because I was just used to being treated like crap. And um, it was just a normal thing for me. So there was no real good goodness or good times in my home. So I didn't have this situation where there was all abuse and then there was love and then there was abuse and then there was love. It was just all abuse. And uh, it, there was no love, you know what I mean? So that's the whole issue. That's why I think that's why I didn't I didn't split, maybe. That's prob- probably why. A lack of integration. On the inside, feeling you are bad or evil. On the outside, being a super achiever, developing a false self. So that's a lack of in- oh, a lack of integration. That's quite interesting. I know I have some, you know, I know that there's, that, that can happen to people, right? On the inside, you're feeling bad or, or evil. Or I could be feeling bad or evil because of what happened, right? The abuse and the way that I feel about myself, especially if you're battered as a child uh, verbally, mentally, psychologically, along with the sexual abuse or any physical abuse, uh, it sort of makes you feel like you are a bad person and that 
you must be right especially if your parents told you you were bad and my my mom especially was very good at making me feel worthless so it, because she told me i was worthless uh you know not every day but on, whenever i was in trouble uh or getting a beaten you know uh she would throw that in there and make sure that all the verbal assaults were there with it so this way i would feel really bad about myself and she was just trying to hurt me right which was she did and uh you know, we develop a false self, false sense of self that way, right? Because on the outside in the world, we're trying to be, uh, appear to be on, in control, and everything's great, no problem. But on the inside, we're crumbling and saying, oh, uh, you know, oh, you know, I couldn't be worth much. You know, look what my parents said about me, or look what look what my abuser said about me, right? The thing is, is that that's that's why we have to get help, uh, because abuse is wrong, and you know, we are worth something. We do count, and we do matter, and there's no possible way we could be worthless, you know what I mean? This is what abusers do to make you crumble, to make you fall. And they will do they will do and say whatever they can to hurt you, right? So that's why, you know, my mom did what she did. She was, she was lashing out, hurting me, because she was hurting. And so, you know, when I was young, I didn't realize that, of course, and so I took all that to heart, right? But as I got older, especially just now, so like late 30s, I started because I still had a lot of the same issues. I still wanted to self-harm. I, I wanted to, I was not planning on killing myself. I had suicidal thoughts. You know, I, I was seriously thinking I wanted to be out of the pain and misery, you know, of of this whole feeling that I had in my heart, you know, hatred and anger. And, and this was about three years ago. And, you know, uh, I always felt really bad about myself, very self conscious that I was a worthless person, that it was useless, no good. You know, everything my mother had told me would just resound in my head. It would just go through my head. It would replay like a like a tape player just going around and around and around. I could just hear her voice, you know. And I, I still do, actually. But now I know where to put it. It just doesn't matter to me anymore because I know better. You know, I know that we do deserve to to have a good life. We deserve everything everybody else has, you know, the right to a good life and a healthy life, right? And that uh, what she said was wrong. It wasn't true. There was no truth in it. And uh, how could there be? You know what I mean? I am worth something. You are worth something. And you are a good person. And I don't care what anybody told you. Um, that's the whole issue, right? Abusers just do what, do what they do. They abuse, you know? So we don't have to live our lives, you know, um, sort of believing that garbage. You know what I mean? Too many people will continue to believe that garbage. I did until I was almost 40. So I can sit there and I can tell you. You know, it's like some people would say, well, how could that happen? It can happen, let me tell you. Uh, emotional, psychological, mental abuse is very, very harmful, uh, very dangerous, way worse than any physical abuse, except for physical abuse that leads to death, you know, or some sort of crippling physical abuse. But I'm talking uh, just... Uh, uh, we're talking beatings, you know, uh, just normal beatings, you know, which would, most people wouldn't consider normal, but that don't put you in the hospital. But, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Those the, 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 those go away. The, the stings from the belts and stuff go away. And, and you know what I mean? The, you can heal some cuts and bruises. But, man, I tell you what happens to hurt with psychological and mental and emotion, emotional abuse, verbal abuse. It, it It really breaks your heart. And it causes you to have all kinds of issues regarding you know, self-esteem and confidence and stuff. So that's why, you know, we don't have to keep on believing that, that, that those lies, you know. We don't have to continue to feel that we're bad people or, or whatever and then try to be a super achiever on the outside, not, not allowing ourselves to even enjoy this life, you know, and trying to be so perfect all the time. Um, you know, the whole thing is we, we deserve to have a good life like everybody else and be able to relax and enjoy ourselves and go after those dreams and goals that we have and uh, set some small goals and, and accomplish them and realize that we can do it. You know, we don't have to be living with this bad feeling on the inside of us. And it took me 40 years to figure that out. So I know how long it would take. You know, my brother killed himself at the age of 43, drug overdose. Uh, he knew he was what he was doing. And uh, I don't think it, he didn't, he, I don't think he meant it, it was suicide. Uh, but I, he was always on drugs. And he knew eventually that one day those drugs would take his life. So he was basically just commit, committing suicide in a different way. And another brother of mine committed suicide in his 30s, the age of 33. Uh, he, uh, real suicide. So this, he, he had tried before, so it wasn't like an accident or anything like that. We knew he was trying to kill himself. But what can you do? Because uh, when, when the abuse is so bad like that, it just messes the mind up. And I'm telling you, in, in the heart, you know. So you have to make sure you get help. I don't care, you know, reach out and get some help. Just keep reaching out. You know, there's online support groups. If you don't trust 
people too much, you know, you don't trust, because I know trust is a huge issue. Uh, you know, if you don't trust therapists and counselors and whatnot, get involved in an online support group where you can kind of remain anonymous. You don't even have to give your real name. You can just use some pretend name, and then you can get some help from people who are, um, you know, who have been through a lot of this stuff and know what it's like, you know, to, to have to deal with the aftermath of childhood sexual abuse or any other abuse, right? So they, you know, they, they're out there. These support groups are out there. I belong to a couple of them, and I think that they're just awesome. And I think that, you know, when I first joined up, it was a bit nerve-wracking. I had never done anything like that before. But I thought, man, what a great opportunity to, to talk with people. Now, I've been way too busy lately to even get involved. Uh, but I still have moments, you know, where I think, man, I, I really need some support right now. You know, I still have days where I go through, uh, you know, feelings or something will come up and trigger the abuse or trigger something that happened years and years and years ago. So, I mean, it does happen, right? And then I think, yeah, I'm, and then I do, you know, I have a lot of friends and stuff who are supporting me, and I think that just makes a huge difference uh, to have people who will support you. And that's why you don't want to hang around with abusive people uh, who are just going to continue to abuse you. You pick your friends and, and very carefully because you want to have a good life. So pick people who are positive people, who are going to support you through this whole thing and people that are there for you no matter what, your good days and your bad days. And that's a real friend, someone who be who will be there with you on the, the, your very worst day. That's the type of friend you want to have, right? Because if they're only there because you're feeling great, they're not a very good friend. Uh, if you're feeling down that's, and, and a friend sticks around, you know you have a really good friend. And I have a lot of those good friends because they're there with me right, like right now. So it's just it's so awesome. Out-of-body experience is another one. During the abuse, feeling that one watched the abuse occurring to one's body like an out-of-body experience. I've heard of that with people who have experienced a lot of childhood sexual abuse where they will actually leave their body and they can see what's happening. I totally believe that this happens to people. The reason being is I had a couple of out-of-body experiences, uh, but not during the sexual molestation, but at other times in my youth. And... Uh, I totally believe that it is very possible to have an out-of-body experience. I've, I had two of them myself. Uh, control issues. The more chaotic family life in childhood, the stronger control issues are an issue. I don't think I have uh, very many control issues. I almost have no control issues. People just do whatever they want, but if they screw up in my life, they're out. Um, you know, that's my problem. <laughs> Is I don't I don't control everything, but I just don't give anybody a break. So like if somebody in my life just makes a mistake, I'm like bye bye because I cannot take any more abuse. You know, so I'm a nice person, but I tell you what I you know and I always tell people you know I'm nice, but that doesn't mean you can walk on me because you'll be out of my life so fast uh, before you even turn around you'd be gone, uh, and that's uh, I almost have to be careful with that because people make mistakes. And people do things that they don't mean to do. And, uh, you know, and, and then I, uh, because I have these issues with trust and, and uh, not wanting to take any more abuse off of anyone, I tend to push people away um, if they even make the slightest mistake. And so I have to be really careful about that. You know, and I'm not rude about it. I'm just like, bye-bye, you know, because I want good people in my life who are, who are going to be supportive and who are not going to hurt me because I spent so many years uh, being hurt and just watching uh just watching my family be destroyed, you know. So I'm tired of it, and I want to get like So I'm very picky and particular about who I talk to and who I hang out with. But, and so before you know, it, it's, it is hard for us. It's very hard for us. So I have to learn to allow that in my life as well, right? And uh, just remember that people do make mistakes. But we have about a minute left. And I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. I'm so happy to be, let me tell you, it's a volunteer position, but it's awesome. And if anyone needs any information regarding child abuse, uh, how to prevent child abuse, you can get that on our website at http dreamcatchersforabusedchildren.com. We have, you know, that's a great website for survivors. I would go check that out. If you haven't checked out our website, you need to do that. HTTP DreamcatchersForAbusedChildren.com Because when I saw that website, I'm telling you, tears came to my eyes because it was started by Sandra Don Potter, CEO and founder of Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. She started that because her own daughter was sexually abused by a family member. You want to go check this out. She, she's given her life since 2007. Uh, to to st help stop child abuse and child sexual abuse uh, for other children. She's given her life to do this. And I would like everybody to go and check that website out because it's so healing and it really supports 
uh, people like myself who have been through hell and now are coming out into the light. And so, you know, go check it out. It's just such an amazing place to hang out. And you can get some real information there regarding uh, how to help uh, parents who are having problems. You know, if parents think that they, they might be abusing their children, they can get help there too. So everybody have a great day. Take care of yourselves. And I'll be back on tomorrow morning. Uh, with uh, one child abuse survivor to another at the same time, 6 o'clock a.m. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.